thanks for showing up when a lawyer is on stage. <laughs> I have a very difficult question to answer tonight. What can we expect from the lawyers, especially when we talk about such very important terms such as radical transparency? And I try to figure out a lawyer in a world of radical transparency, where would we end up? In a footnote somewhere, I suppose. Hidden text. So I suppose you, know, you will all agree, at least half of the room will say nothing to answer that question, and the other half would say not much. Okay, so my job is to convince you in the next 15 minutes or so that that's not entirely true. You, you may expect something from the lawyers. You may expect, uh, first, table of contents, you know. Us lawyers, we don't like to step in and give an advice unless we know the facts. And the facts of the case here is really to understand what we're talking about when we talk about intellectual property. And then, what are we talk, talking about when we talk about open science? And of course, the real question is, are those two notions compatible, and to what extent, and how can lawyers help maybe ease the frictions between those two notions? So, IP, uh, I like this definition of the World Intellectual Property Organization that is here at the Lake of Geneva, in Geneva itself, because it shows a very noble vision of intellectual property. It refers to creations of the mind, such as inventions, literary and artistic works, designs, symbol names and images used in commerce, everything that basically contributes to the progress of the humankind. We all know that the reality of intellectual property, especially when you need to discuss that with IP lawyers on the other side of the Atlantic, does not fully reflect all this very noble and naive notion of what is intellectual property. But still, what is interesting is that behind that, there is the idea of the freedom of ideas. Historically, intellectual property in the continental Europe and in the common law systems has been developed on the basis that everything is free, except for limited situations where we think it's fair to basically grant a monopoly for a limited duration and specific use to an IP owner. But the default rule in terms of coding, computer systems, the default flag is it's free. And in particular, the ideas are free. The way they are expressed in writing with some originality, individuality, as described in the patent application claim, this is protected. But you do not steal an idea. You steal the way it is expressed in the source code of a software. You steal the idea it is ex expressed in a patent claim description. Let's not forget that, because I think it is extremely important when we talk about open science. The default rule for the law in terms of intellectual property is freedom, with limited exceptions, at least historically. And, and uh, the default rule for open science should be it's open unless there are reasons for to restrict the sharing of, of knowledge. Of course, the reality is totally different because we can't basically brief air now without getting the permission of someone. And, and, um, and the tech companies in particular have been extremely aggressive in filing patents and in basically getting you, getting a license to you so that they permit you, they allow you to use their wonderful services. In terms of IP, there are two broad categories. I'm not gonna go into the details here. The point is, you have patents, industrial property, and you have copyright. You have, of course, many different things. No? You have trade secrets, you have design. But I think it is important for the purposes of this short presentation to focus on those two categories. So when we talk about a patent, you talk about a technical invention, an industrial process that needs to be reproduced, is not obvious, and basically solves a problem. If you get that patent, then you get a monopoly on any use in the field of use of that patent. Copyright, it's a little bit different. Copyright does not need to be registered. Copyright basically is your expression of something that is original. It does not need to be beautiful to watch. It can really be ugly. Nevertheless, it is protected by copyright. And in, if basically it is protected by copyright, and that's a self-proclamation that whatever I write is protected by copyright, if it's sufficiently original, there is no need to file, then I am the only one to decide what can happen with the use, the reproduction, the copy of that work. 
And open science, just one slide, because I'm certainly not here to talk about open science, the way I understand it is a new approach of the scientific process based on the cooperative work and new ways of diffusing knowledge by using digital technologies and collaborative tools. Very ambitious, as naive and noble as the definition of, of intellectual property by the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, the, 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 the current spirit of open science, as I understand it, is that everything should be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. It's not everything is open, not everything is closed, but you have the default rule of being open unless there is a reason to basically limit the sharing of knowledge. Now, if you take a look at what is important here tonight from a legal perspective during this presentation is how can we balance those two notions? On the one hand, you know, uh, I don't know, blue short, of the ring, you have intellectual property. Intellectual property owners are very keen to claim their ownership on something that has been filed. And they claim that ownership because they want to exercise a very strict control over any use of whatever has been produced and is protected. And their objective is very clear, just to maximize the profits, because they think that they have invested a lot of time, resources, money, into developing something that needs to be protected. If I don't get that return, my financial return, then there is no use making research. That's the argument, of course, uh, of, of all people behind patents saying, you know, if I'm not sure I get 20 years to get extract money from this invention, I'm not going to invest in the first place money to try and invent something. On the other side, so the, the, the yellow short, the other side of the ring, you have a, something that is not as easily understandable because the ownership claim in open science is more diffuse. No one will step up and say, that's mine. So basically it's a more collective vision of it's ours, but we don't know who exactly it is, but whose invention it is, but everybody here in the room has the right to use that, or we need to share among ourselves the results of that work. But no one will hire a lawyer to make a memorandum to determine who is the exact owner of this intellectual property. And guess what? Our objective is as clear as the guy on the other side of the ring, because what we want to do is precisely to promote extensive use sharing diffusion of that knowledge without any frontiers, financial frontiers, legal frontiers, or barriers. But you know what? If we win this fight, we don't know what to do with that because the, the objective is to share as much knowledge as possible, but we can't benchmark the return on investment. That's the, the problem. There is no clear objective in terms of winning and monetizing the invention. The idea, of course, is not to have intellectual property and open science fight the idea, not a wall between them. The idea is to bridge the gap. And how could lawyers bring, bridge the gap between intellectual intellectual property champions and open science champions are basically by doing their job, finding ways to bridge the gap. There are several attempts so far and frankly quite successful attempts. So I'm already telling you that lawyers, you can expect from lawyers some answers. Let's have a look at, for example, patent pooling or open source licensing, creative commons publishing, and some of the open access, open innovation models. I like the patent pooling attempt to bridge the gap between the need to share knowledge and the need to claim ownership. Are you familiar with patent pooling? Are you familiar with Narcos? Season three, because the, uh, the gentlemen of Cali, Caballeros de Cali, okay? So think of them as, you know, the IBMs, Microsoft, <laughs> big pharma companies, they make things run. Everything <laughs> runs well in Cali. Everybody gets, gets his share of, of, of the knowledge. So the idea is that you have first to play that game, you need to have patents, lots of patents. You need to sit on a pile of patents and basically try and intimidate and impress others by bringing to the table hundreds, if not thousands of patents. So that you have the ammunition, you know, you, you, you put the gun on the table, but you are nice. I'm not going to sue you for every possible infringement on that patents, pile of patents. 
I'm going to leave my gun here, and you agree to leave your gun, and nobody is going to shoot anyone in court. But if we are attacked, so someone outside of the cartel tries to invalidate one of our patents, or thinks we are hindering innovation, then we all take our guns and we shoot that person, right? I'm not inciting violence. That's, I'm not tweeting. That's, it's, it's an image. So, uh, it's very efficient in terms of reconciliating intellectual property and the need to share among a certain community the patent without fear of being abused or being sued. Cross-licensing. You just use the existing tools, an agreement among the patent pool members to basically not sue a covenant, not to sue each other in case, by accident, someone uses a technology that is not his. Okay. It's often associated with complex technologies, especially in situations where no one understands who owns which patents. <laughs> so at the end of the day, they say, okay, everybody owns everything and we don't sue each other. One of the most famous and successful examples of uh, patent pooling is the Open Innovation Network, defending the contributors to the Linux system and the Android system. Okay, so you have all the big guns out there, IBM, Google, Toyota, uh, and, and other, other people. And, and, and basically it works. So, you know, the, law, the lawyers have found a way to implement a community, very large community, where IP is not a barrier to the sharing of information. Of course, if you're outside of Cali, if you're outside of the cartel, it might be different. And of course, in terms of broader economic reasoning, is it really good for innovation to have those guys maintaining among themselves, uh, while they are competitors, a kind of an agreement or understanding that they will not sue each other? Other initiatives from the legal community to try and bridge the gap, the, the general public license, free software, free as in freedom, okay, so GPL. That works in the software world, and what is interesting, that, that, that's really what I want to insist on. It does not require new laws, it's just a new way of drafting license agreements. It's a copyleft license. Instead of telling you, you want to use that software, I agree that you use that software, but you are not allowed to modify that software. It's the reverse. Please use that software, but please modify it, but if you do, you're obliged to put the modified version available to everyone. Okay, publication of the source code for free. That's the copyleft principle, but relying on good old copyright. Open access, you know better than me about open access. Uh, it's for me not the one size fits all solution for any possible application of open science. It has a lot of progress uh, to, 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 to do still. And as we have just realized, it's not because you have basically access to raw data that you will be helpful. The transparency that goes with the sharing is, is uh, incredibly uh, valuable. And you have also the Creative Commons initiative. Uh, I su suppose you know that. Maybe you have a look at the right-hand side, bottom of my slides. This wonderful copyrighted original piece of slides is available under Creative Commons. But you can't make money out of that, sorry, because I use the, so you need to say it comes from me, it's the attribution buy, then can't, no commercial, you can't put that in a kind of commercial advertising campaign on Google that you want to make, and non-derivative. I don't want you to basically change anything in this presentation, but I could have chosen the CC buy, and then you have access to that. And what is interesting is that com Creative Commons is also Again, a license, it's a permissive license. So we are back using the same good old tools that we think build a barrier between open science and intellectual property. Permissive licensing works. Another, maybe I'll, I'll skip that, but uh, uh, another um, way to bridge intellectual property and open science is to go through open innovation models where basically through agreements, you outsource the R&D, and then you make sure that everybody participating to this R&D has some kind of access to the result. What, for example, Netflix did 
for uh, the, the improvement of the search prediction algorithm regarding the, the movie database. So they were not able to do that internally. So they came clean and transparently to the market. We need your help. Please help us improve that algorithm. So open innovation, not trying to do it yourself. Reaching out. So um, time to try and answer that, that question. What can we expect from the lawyers? Actually, not much is, is the wrong answer. I think quite a lot. And it's not a question of what the lawyers should do in the future. Lawyers have already helped intellectual property being shared through existing tools, and in particular, permissive licensing. It works in practice. So don't trust a lawyer that tells you that you can't, from a, because of a legal argument, share what you have produced. There are ways to do that. There are tools to do that. The reason why it can't be done, maybe, is because you have already signed an agreement before that prevents you from doing that. But the legal framework exists. My personal view, however, is that this is clearly not sufficient because it has been perceived, designed, has been built and implemented only as a temporary fix to a system that is flawed. Patent pools are designed to counter frivolous attacks by trolls. Okay, so if someone tries to attack the Kali cartel, that person will better have strong guns because otherwise that person will be destroyed. But it was a defensive move by patent holders to make sure that basically their patents would hold in case of an attack. Open source works fine in principle, especially for software, but there are a lot of issues regarding open source that make it more difficult to implement right now than fought a couple of years ago. In particular, the ego of the contributors to the open source movement. So even if you change the principles, you still have to deal with persons uh, and, and their creations, and this is a problem. Creative Commons is a great tool because you can standardize licensing terms. You just with one logo, instead of a full agreement to negotiate, you know what is the possible permissive use that you can make out of, out of a copyrighted work. It helps. But if you get out of the standard set of available Creative Commons, then you're back to square one and it's more difficult to get the information out. So legal tools exist, lawyers can help, but what we need, what we need is not the lawyers to spend more time on all these permissive licenses. What we need is a clear policy push to basically embed open science arguments by design and by default in every research project. And this may come certainly through the legislation, but also within universities. That's, you know, we're in the, the campus of a university and, and uh, I beg the university to basically reconsider some of the agreements with researchers, what is expected from researchers. It needs to be clear from the beginning that they might be, of course, sometimes expected to teach something, but also to share some of their knowledge and sharing means sharing honestly in radical transparency. I fully agree with that. It's not about checking the bus, say I share, I've shared the results of my project. It needs to be done in, very, in a very professional way. Second, the agreements with the industry. It's very difficult for a univers university to resist a claim by an industry player to get a kind of a preview or limited ownership on the data produced by a research. Nevertheless, it is extremely important that you, the university insists on getting some possibility to use any data that is produced through the computers or the mines or the equipment of a university. I am currently frustrated by also the absence of flexibility and understanding, usually from technology transfer offices. They are totally, in the past, focused on patent licensing and not taking into consideration possible innovations through different business models. And of course, uh, uh, consortiums are, are the best place to promote the best practices. You can't expect others to share anything if in your agreements you show cowardness or an attempt to hide, uh, basically, uh, cowardness is not the right word, but basically an attempt not to go uh, through uh, the uh, willingness to share everything that might be valuable to others, if not valuable to you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, 
is there any question? Um, I'm not allowed to talk about that because I have an NDA in place with uh, <laughs> Netflix. <laughs> um, a different way of running a business, but not much choice for the people involved in that business. <laughs> Plata or, or Plomo, it's the same, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this talk. Very interesting from for the point of, from the point of view of someone who uh, is involved in the coordination of, uh, of, of large research projects. Uh, in European Commission funded grants, you have both the requirement by the Commission to exploit your results or your IP and to make it open. What kind of uh, of legal uh, trick you can play to to make this happen? especially for large um, joint IP, where basically no one knows who owns and who did yeah. what? Uh, it, it needs to become a standard clause and standard provision in those large agreements for smaller players to implement that. Um, otherwise, the other way would be to basically go to uh, the Swiss parliament in Switzerland and ask for the passing of a law that requires that any possible um, publicly funded research needs to have that in place. So no public money available to any research unless there is a, a clear commitment to do exactly what you've mentioned. But um, I, I think it, it's, you know, I, I don't think that any university is wrong. I think they are afraid of setting a precedent and being the first one to basically change what has been done in the past years. So if you get this kind of provisions and this kind of requirements in large projects, then basically if someone else does it, okay, why not do it ourselves? It's slower, but it's going to be more efficient than changing the law. So you, you talk about uh, codes, and I have a specific question about the copyright for databases in uh, Switzerland, because I think there is a gap at the moment. There is no copyright for someone who has uh, built a database in Switzerland while this exists in Europe or in other countries? Yes. Can well, you tell us a little bit? Sure. More? My answer would be there is no gap in Switzerland. The U U European directive at the time, that's the mistake, to put any copyright in the database. <laughs> so yes, you're right. There is no per se protection of databases in Switzerland while there is a provision, database protection, in the European Union law. But it was a political decision at the time. I don't think there is any reason to protect a database as such. Databases might be protected under Swiss law under different rules. So you have unfair competition. So basically, if you extract the structure of a database, you replicate it, and you compete directly without having made the right investments to have this structure in place, you would have a possibility to, 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 to claim uh, unfair competition. So you are protected somehow. But as such, the database does not have the, the same protection. I don't think the future would be for Switzerland to align with the European Union. I think it would be for the European Union to acknowledge that it's, this is a very strange and artificial animal in the world of intellectual property. Okay, you, you, yes. you put a copyright as soon you think there is a, a creation and believe me, many of the databases that are generated by researchers, at least in biology, I'm coming from this field, there is really a, a creation from the researchers and I'm not sure you will convince researchers with your... No, I'm sure I, I, I'm sure debate. I'm sure I won't. Although I work for some consortiums and they try to think about something else. The question is, are the clients or the users of this database willing to pay? They are going to pay if the service is good, if the database is efficient. So it's not about forgetting about being paid. It's about making sure that the discourse and the argument, you're paying me because I have a database that is valuable to you, is a totally different argument that 
then you are paying me because I own some intellectual property in this database. And only this, the first argument is the one that basically will position the database. People look at Reuters and Thompson, people are paying crazy amounts of money for those guys. It's just basically repackaging of financial information available to anyone. But there is a service, there is a purpose. I don't want to do that, consolidate all that data myself. So if you can add some branding, positioning, added value service on the top of the database itself, people would be willing to pay. But because it's valuable, not because it's IP that is imposed to the, to the end user. But of course there are exceptions, I'm here to make an <laughs> argument. Great. Uh, thanks, Michel, for the great talk. I was Welcome. wondering if the uh, patent pools on behalf of the university media will actually improve the technology transfer from academia to industry, and what would be the reaction of the industry? So say at EPFL we have, what, two lawyers at the TTO? So if the universities in Switzerland join together and do this patent pooling, what will happen? Peace in the world. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I think, you know, if, if you go down the route of patent pooling, it's not just because you think it's good or maybe because it's going to be okay in this specific project. It's, it's, it's a route that there is no going back because you, you, you can't just contribute all your patents, then wait for three years and that basically, you know, I've changed my strategy and then I want to retreat from that. So uh, no, I'm not familiar with the uh, family of, of patents owned by Swiss universities, but I do not think that the Swiss universities would anyhow sue themselves, maybe I'm wrong, for patent infringement. <laughs> so this is not the typical competitive landscape the makers of smartphones are facing. Yes. that are associated with breast cancer risk and all other cancer yes. risks. Is there any kind of way to push to a company, Myriad Genomics, to give up their IP in some way because it's for the common good? So it lets people know that DNA repair is necessary and that everybody that has these mutations is at a higher risk of mutations that cause their cancer. Yeah, w without being too cynical, I think uh, a company right now would accept to basically give up any claims on a patent if that patent is considered in not valuable for the company. So uh, the, the, the approach here is a little bit different. It's you are not making any use of that patent right now. You're not going to have the money to do it in the years to come. You've lost all, of you, all your team. If you assign that patent to us on certain nice terms, we're going to make a wonderful website telling how great you are in open innovation and contributing to the common good. And then basically you talk to the marketing department instead of talking to the financial department. If there is any value to the patent, they will resist.